Dang. Too late now, because here we go. Sounds good. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance. It is weekly scrap number 87. My guest today is Mike Turpak. He has been in the fire service for 45 years, 36 of it with Jersey City, where he rose through the ranks and only recently retired as deputy chief. He's been on engines, ladders, rescues, and if you know Jersey City at all, you know it is one of the most densely populated cities per square mile in the United States. If you want experience, he has it. Uh, if you want to talk about books, he has those also because he's written six best-selling books, including the arguable Bible on Fireground Size Up. And as if all of that isn't enough, he is a very educational and entertaining speaker who I had the pleasure to listen to this March. So, Chief Mike Turpak, it's my pleasure to have you on as the guest of Weekly Scrap number 87. Welcome, my brother. Thank you, my brother. So happy to be here. Great to see you again. Seems like it was uh, just yesterday. Was I guess it was about a month or two ago. How yeah. long? Where? Yes. Yeah, good Early to see March, you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks again. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. So to everyone watching live, if you have questions for Mike or myself, please do not hesitate to put them in the comments. Uh, did I miss anything in the intro? Anything you want to add? No, that's more than enough. Uh, you gave me too much credit already, I think. But no, no, thank you. That was great. All right, perfect. Uh, I'll just kick it right off and go right into it because I got so much I want to get to with you. A quote mm -hmm. I took from you when you spoke down there at the uh, Third Coast Fire Conference. You said the key to successful firefighting is anticipation. Yes, yes. Great quote. And I, I can't take credit for the quote. Um, uh, I say this in all my seminars. I always, always lead off with that quote. And I know we said it when we were together back in Texas. Um, it was a quote that came out of a book uh, that I read, oh, God, probably 40 years ago. Uh, Firefighting Principles and Practice by mm. William Clark, a uh, retired battalion chief from the city of New York. Um, and he wrote two editions. Uh, he's since passed away. Never met the gentleman, but he had that quote in his book that I just, you know, 40 plus years ago, I gravitated towards. And it made so much sense back then as a young firefighter, before I was a decision maker, I said, oh, my God, this is this is kind of the foundation of your thinking. And then I put size up on top of that to kind of enhance that quote. And uh, I think it's led to a uh, one a decent career, uh, some great conversations at the kitchen table and classroom. So, uh yeah, the key to successful firefighting is anticipation. I don't think anybody out there can argue with that one. I think it's a good one. No, it's a, yeah. it's a fundamental. I think it's very hard to argue with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken Robertson said, hi, Corley. Hey, Chief Mike. John Cannell said, hello from Collinsville Firefighters, IAFF, local 2625. Saw you speak about a year or two ago when you spoke in Collinsville at the Fireman's Hall. Yes. Marcio. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, a lot of fun. I remember the places uh, vividly. Yes, great to see everybody. Thank you. We got hi from Corpo de Bombarios, Sapadores de Faro in Portugal. So we're worldwide tonight. There you go. Good. Garrett Toe said, good evening, Chief. So we're getting it started right. We got lots of comments already coming in. So don't forget Good. to send your questions. All right. You have to start paying attention once you have responsibility. Again, I'm throwing quotes at you that I wrote down in my notes when I saw you, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, because your other option is to be a piece of shit. <laughs> I actually said that. Me, a guy from Jersey who so well, you know, articulating and uh, you know, speaks the Queen's English. I actually said that out loud. I can't believe that. Uh, it's true, though. I, I, I know you've been with me before, and I, I, I don't want to say I, I jump around a lot when I teach, but, you know, there are times when I do this, I point to the collar. I say, you got something on your collar that indicates you're a boss, a lieutenant, a captain, battalion chief, whatever it may be. You got to take this seriously. I mean, this is where the buck stops. You got to cross your T's, dot your I's, and you got to know as much as you can about your, I always say the word, your backyard, you know, things that you're going to frequent every day, whether it's a private dwelling or a multiple dwelling or a guard apartment and uh, i'm dead serious about that because i've had the opportunity over my few years to work with some great people who were bosses that i kind of followed their coattails and of course we all could tell stories where i work with some people that shouldn't have been there right they didn't take that you know that bar on the collar seriously and i said i can't be like that guy i can't you know, i can't I don't want to be anywhere near that type of individual's lack of decision making. So it was a motivator and it continues to be a motivator. Yeah, it does. Do you feel like you were more motivated by the lackadaisical or the incompetent, or do you feel like you were more inspired by the, the great and the competent? 
I, I tell you what, I would if I had a pick, it would be the, probably the more great or competent people, the incompetent people. Uh, yes, that was an influencing factor, but when I worked with somebody who, you know, I would fall down the hallway, I knew I was going to be fine. Uh, they were looking out for us. They knew the building. They knew conditions. They knew, you know, the different challenges regarding the occupancy or the fire load. I said, I want to be like that guy. And, yeah. you know, that motivated me. Of course, when you sell those, uh, I'll say the word you said before, it's those pieces of shit, if I can say that, uh, you know, I said, uh, how did he get here and how do we get rid of this guy there's such a way and stay away from that because right. obviously i don't want anybody to get hurt or, or you know they get adversely impacted in some way you know do you have any advice for someone who is stuck with an incompetent uh an incompetent is such a strong word but along those lines someone who doesn't take the job seriously or yeah yeah, uh, get out of there. Uh, you know, if you can, uh, transfer it to another company. Uh, I mean, if you don't have the ability to influence that person or make that decision to try to motivate them or mentor them, let's say you're you're below them in rank structure. I mean, you got to be careful. I mean, you got to take care of yourself. You got a wife and kids at home or a husband and kids at home. And uh, yeah, you have to get out of there. And uh, obviously, if you can, eventually, when you have that rank, try to go back to that individual if there's such a way and bring them back in. You know, mentor them, motivate them, you know, bring them back into the to the game because it's a serious game. It's, this is no joke. It's not, nothing, nothing that is, you know, you can't be passive or complacent about anything that we do in the fire service at all. Zero. Zero room for the complacency. And it, yet, yet it's so easy for it to creep in. That's the that's the the, the, the crazy part about it. Um, experience and knowledge and situational awareness. Three things that I think are the pillars of kind of what you teach. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk on it for a second, if you would, and then we'll start getting into the nitty gritty. Well, I think to your point a moment ago, it's, um, I had the opportunity in our city. I was able to work as a firefighter in an engine, a ladder, and a rescue before I became a company officer. And the objective behind that was, to one, obviously to work as in the busy companies I could find throughout the city. But, but to learn to trade, understand how the engine dovetails with the ladder and, and how the ladder dovetails with the engine, then the overall picture of the rescue uh, and having a good understanding of those disciplines. Um, I think that made me a better fire officer when I got promoted to company officer. And it actually worked its way up, in my opinion, in my decision making as a chief officer. So the, the point being, uh, you know, seek it. I mean, there are there are opportunities out there uh, if it's not within your own department. It could be through, and I know you've talked about this before, you know, through social media or the, the internet. There's a lot of great stuff out there. I mean, there's some challenges with all the stuff out there. Right. But there's a lot of great, a lot of great intel out there from a lot of great people across, you know, the United States, Canada, and across, I actually across the world. I mean, from London, Portugal. Uh, it's there. It's at your fingertips. More so when I started. When I started in the 70s, we didn't have any of this stuff. Right. It was pretty, pretty much what you learned at the kitchen table. You know the training division uh, and of course everything we learned was in the street and again it was a great learning experience don't get me wrong but you quickly knew who the people that you needed to gravitate towards you knew the people pretty quickly after a couple of good jobs who you had to stay away from right uh, and uh, that was kind of like how you navigated things now you can do that today to some degree but then you could put all this other education on top whether it's you know the internet or taking a class, reading an article from one of the magazines, uh, there's opportunity there is unlimited. It's amazing what we can do today in the fire service if you just sit down and apply yourself. No, the sheer the sheer amount of knowledge that is available at at your literally at your fingertips with the with the smartphones nowadays. Yeah. So it's yeah. just crazy. It's it is it is crazy. Um. So I wanted I wanted to ask you this question, and, and is what is the biggest misconception that you have encountered as you've taught fire ground size up and command? Oh, great question. Um, a lot of times I'll I'll pose a question similar to what you just posed in the beginning of the class, and a lot of times the guys and gals will talk about size up and begins. <clears throat> excuse me, at the receipt of the alarm, and I, I and I say all due respect, I said. Just think about what you just said for a second here and try to, to sit back and think about the bigger picture. And what I tried to do is I, you know, regarding misconception, I said, I think it begins, in my opinion, well before we see a deal on, you know, your pre-incident information, your pre-planning on the building, you know, knowing that particular district regarding the area of water supply 
or the specific address and the building's height, construction, and occupancy type for it. If there's non-ambulatory people there, or if there's some, you know, inherent hazards within the building regarding contents, that pre-planned stuff. And that's, you know, I joke about this in class too. I think I did this when you and I are in Texas. I go, some people might think that's the boring stuff, you know, going out and doing a walkthrough of a building, you know, gathering intel. I call it building intel. But I said, and I know I've said this before with you in class. I believe I have that you might think that's not important until you get, and I take my finger, here's my finger again, right? Until you get rank, you get something on your collar. And then when you realize you're a decision maker, you see the value in that pre-incident size up. Right. That's well well before they receive the alarm because you got to know before you go. Uh, and because it does make for a better anticipative decision, right? We can put those words together. So I think the biggest mis misconception regarding size up is, is, is when it begins. I say it begins when you want it to begin, to be quite honest. Nice, nice. And it really goes back to Clark and anticipation. Yeah, it really does. It's it really does. Full yeah. circle already. Yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> uh, lots, of, lots of good evenings and hellos. We got from Keyport Fire Department in New Jersey. We got it from Indianapolis, Indiana, from Sam Alexander and Jaden Graham, respectively. John Haywick has chimed in and said, evening, Chief. Uh, Jacob Johnson said he's excited for this one. One of the most important ones, I think that's the first time ever, I've got a hi, Dad, from an Ashley Turpak. pack. So, oh, my, oh my yeah, go. I have, yeah, I have twin girls. Uh, Ashley's down in Celebration, Florida. Hi, sweetie, love you. Awesome. And my, my other daughter, she's uh, up in Connecticut. Uh, she goes to Sacred Heart University. So, yeah, my two girls, I love them both dearly. Thank you. Awesome. All right, we got our first question coming at you. Are you ready? Yep, throw All it right. at me. I'm ready. Dan Bender, he said, Chief T., I don't know if that's a if that's a it's a go to nickname or not, but we'll throw it out there. Chief T, you told a story while in Pensacola about how you were at a job that a good three sixty, where I'm at, three sixty wasn't accomplished, and the outcome on the Charlie side was bad. If possible, could you run through it again? I think a lot of scene commanders need to hear it. Yeah, wow, that's a that's a great question, and it's also an emotional question. You know, quite honestly. Um, in a lot of the seminars over the last year or so, I just haven't brought that particular story up because it, many times it was always tough to get through. Uh, but I'll, I'll condense it down real quick here for you because I think there's some value in this one. Um, I was a new battalion chief. I was working out in the 2nd Battalion in our part of the city. It's a you know, busy area. still is a busy area. And um, the chiefs in Jersey City, and way back when we all chiefs way back when when I started, we all had aides or drivers, if I can use that word. And of course, when I got promoted, budget cuts, they took the aides away. So the only chief that really had an aide or incident command technician, if I can call them that, was the deputy chiefs. So make a long story short, I'm by myself and I get a fire and they, um, it was a first floor fire in a two or three story occupied frame, multiple dwelling. And of course, I got in there pretty quick, but headed the engine and truck. And uh, I just got out of the car and I did, I say this, this is a quote, I did the worst thing you could do. I got out of the vehicle and I set up command in front of the building, which is a good thing, but I never left the front of the building. Didn't do a quick look down the alley, didn't look in the backyard. And I'm talking about a building that was only about 20 by 40 feet, 20 feet wide, 40 feet deep. Right. And they had a you know, three foot alley on both sides. So. It would have been very easy for me, especially being first stool and being the boss, to take a quick jog down the alley, take a look in the back, and I did not. Long story short, it was a good first floor fire. Uh, the companies, um, they took the glass in the front. The fire, unknownst to me, because I didn't check the back, was in the back. I brought it to the front, you know, because you, you, know, you talk about that flow path thing, that new fancy word. And, you know, we brought it to the front. They brought up the second floor, you know, took two floors, second alarm, went into the exposure. So I'm like, Jesus, God almighty. Yeah, but that's not the worst part of the story. Um, again, unknowns to me, um, there was a, if I came, came across me about, I guess, about 30 or 40 minutes into the fire. Uh, we had the fire pretty much knocked two floors. Companies did a great job. Unknowns to me, there was a, a little girl that was hanging from the second floor rear window. And, uh, the guys found her, she must have jumped, I assume, well, uh, in the back behind the building between a couple of garbage cans and they were working on her. And I always said to myself, and this, you know, like, this is a little emotional. If I got back there and I saw her, I could have, you know, maybe caught her. Or I could have held her there until I got a ladder back there. I could have done a lot of different things uh, that I did not do regarding not only fire spread. I don't, I don't care about losing a freaking building. But losing a, a life like that, which to me was 
one unacceptable. It was avoidable. And ever since that fire, I made an aggressive attempt to get my ass to the back, take a look at the back. Or at the very least, if I couldn't get to the back, so let's say it was all attached, you know, 10 or 15 buildings in a row, I wanted, I prodded the ladder. I go, give me a report from the back. Even when I got promoted to deputy chief, this is very true, and I did this every fire, I would have my aide go to the front of the building to get a, a rundown and accountability with, from the battalion. I would find my way to the back just to look at the back and then go to the front and have a face-to-face -face with the battalion and say, do you know you got fire off three windows on the top floor and the rear? And if he did not acknowledge that or didn't have any intel regarding that, we had a conversation and I kind of not told him the story that I'm telling you now, but I said, listen, the value of the back, I mean, if it looks bad in the front, it can be 10 times worse in the rear. And I go, more importantly, you know, I, unfortunately, I think I lost a kid due to something that could have been easily avoided. So, yeah, I haven't told that story in a while. I think, you know, the, our, the brother for bringing it up and maybe your listeners will learn something from that. You got you to gotta look at all four sides as, as fast as you can. And if you can't get intel on the back and keep getting intel on the back, the sides, the top, uh, five round size up. How's that sound? All right. Damn. Very, very powerful, Chief. Uh, thank you, Dan, for the question. And honestly, man, thank you for being able to share it because that is a powerful story that, that drives home a point that needs to be shared. So uh, yeah. there's not a lot of guys who could share that. So thank you, Chief. Um, Jeff Stone said, Chief, can you talk a little bit about managing the first 15 to 20 minutes of a job where you size up from, an, from on arrival, where you start your command from, and when you do transition to a fixed command post car? Uh, your presentations in Pensacola have been awesome. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, a great, another great question on fixed command post. Um, I think it comes from one, what you've been born and bred into and two, your, your, again, I use this term a lot, your backyard, Jersey city. We could not, again, I know some of your listeners are from the Northeast or from the Jersey, New York area. We could not set up a command post and many of our battalions from, from the, from the vehicle the streets are long and narrow and if i didn't get it into the block first you know i would have to you know park the car down the block or park it on the sidewalk and walk down the block myself or with my aid depending on my you know, where i was rank structure so 99 percent of the time the command posts for me were pretty much set up in front of the building or across the street or on a corner uh, depending on obviously the building and the accessibility. So we were never big about command posts in a car. I know the value of that, but I think there's more value. And it's funny, this, I don't say it's funny. I just had this question the other day. We were doing a program on fire ground size up for the engine truck in chief. And I said, they said the value of for me personally, uh, setting up the command post in the front is I want to be able to see things and then dovetail them into what I'm hearing from the companies on the inside. Because I've been to a couple incidents, quite a few, when the companies were digging in and they were radioing back to me. It looks like we got it. Fire's Almost knocked down. It, right. Yeah. And then I would say on more than one occasion, uh, especially if it looked like a good top floor fire of a frame or, a, you know, like a you know, brick tenement. And I would look and I would see the smoke puffing like a locomotive from the cockle vents. And, I'm, and I would radio back and I would say, you uh, command a 22 engine or 10 engine uh, it's, it's well above you I, I know what they're saying but what i'm seeing is not meshing up from what i'm seeing so that to me has a lot of value in putting the command post in eyesight all right whether you could do it in a car which is nearby that's fine i could not uh getting in front of the building was a mandate by me uh, another point uh, regarding you know, the question was, um, I was always big on getting that first line stretched in, in service and flowing water. Again, well, again, I go back to my backyard. I had some buildings that, you know, had some height and square footage to them, some setbacks and some parts of the battalion where I would kind of sister up, you know, two engines or three engines to get the first line stretched. Um, you know, early on when I first was a battalion chief, you know, again, learning the ropes, is every engine company would grab their own line. Everybody wanted to be on a nozzle, their own nozzle. There was like a competition in the staircase. And I'd be looking at this, this building, and they got a, a third window lighting up, a fourth window lighting up. And I'm looking, they got three lines in the staircase. And I'm like, where, where did everybody go for lunch? I mean, where the hell are they? And it turned, you know, they were all getting jammed up because everybody wanted the fire. So I learned pretty, pretty quick regarding that first 10 or 15 minutes that, 
pull your resources to get that first line stretched because uh, why would you start a second if you weren't almost ensured that the first line was going to get to where it needs to go nice and of course and then adding to that you know making sure the truck was timing the vent timing the glass timing the bulkhead timing the skylight controlling the door in coordination with the water so um I know, I know it's a long-winded answer, but I had to see things. I had to pretty much pull resources. I had to make sure everything was time coordinated. That was the main objective of my first you know, 10, 15 minutes at every incident. Awesome. And, Chief, there is no long-winded. This is a scrap. You take as long as you want. So <laughs> okay. there, is no, there is no limit on your knowledge uh, that, you, that you're willing to share. Uh, David Pruitt said, too often these younger firefighters and officers receive everything sugar-coated and don't learn how to deal with making mistakes. The best educator most days is shared experiences and not repeating the same mistakes over and over. It's a very good point, David. Yes. Uh, Shank S. Cott said, side Charlie report often overlooked by many. Please write in. Yes, right to that point. Uh, next question coming at you from Jacob Johnson said, Chief, <clears throat> what is your opinion of using division chiefs on residential fires as well as having an interior ops chiefs versus an exterior ops chiefs? Or do you think we don't need those positions at all? Oh, a lot of great questions from the group tonight. Um, it comes down to, if I can make this a little bit shorter answer, it comes down to, I think, square footage, to be quite honest. Um, one, uh, there's, a, there's a problem with, you know, chiefs, too many chiefs in the building. You got to let your company officers pretty much do their job. They know how to stretch. They know how to open up. They know how to take glass. They know how to cut roofs, things of that nature. Um, it, but again, I must say, it comes down to square footage. If I get a building that's 20 by 40 or you know 35 by 55 or 60 or 70, I would put personally, I would put one chief in the building to pretty much manage the fire floor to floor above, kind of like to be the traffic cop on the stairs, which is another story we could talk about. Sure. And and let the company officers, the lieutenant and captains, do their job. I don't need that many white shirts in the building, unless it's a large square footage occupancy, a factory, a warehouse. Um, a high rise, of course, a whole different scenario, but your typical run of the mill, 20 by 40s, 30 by 60s type of thing. One white shirt on the inside and let the company officers do their job. I mean, that's the bottom line. So I kind of hold them back. I mean, I know everybody, even white shirts, they want to get in the building too. It's like, even <laughs> though they don't want, they're not going to have a nozzle, but they, I want to, they want to, everybody wants to be in the building to, you know, have, I don't want to say have fun, but, you know, do the job. But, Sometimes if I have an additional battalion chief, like an all-hands chief or, you know, whatever it may be, a second alarm chief, I go, listen, all due respect, you're not going to get into the game at this moment. Maybe the next game later today, but right here, I just need you to plug a hole in the dam when I see it. I got a chief running the inside of the building. So I try, try to keep it simple. Let the company officers make some decisions. That's what they're trained and educated to do. Love that answer. Love that answer. Uh, traffic cop on the stairs. You brought it up, so I'm throwing it back at you. Yeah. Oh, God. I, I think a lot of your listeners will be able to relate to this. I know they will. I, I know my buddy John from Masek was listening in. Uh, a great guy, chief officer, busy city. Um, it, when you put too many people in the building, you know, it's kind of like the conga line. They're all at the bottom of the stairs, on the stairs, trying to get to the fire floor. And there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, you know, I've experienced this myself firsthand. Is like, God forbid if the members on the fire floor, you know, one member runs out of air or things deteriorate and they can't get back down to a refuge, the floor below, because they have to compete or try to jump over, you know, 10 guys on 10 steps. Um, I've talked about this quite honestly a lot when I was a boss, you know, like, and I would give the power to the company officer, then the chief that I would put in the building, I go, listen, keep them on the floor below and bring them up as needed. Keep that staircase, you know, that landing above and below, keep it free for that. Oh shit moment. I mean, uh, listen, how many guys do we need in the building? You know, I'll give you as many as you want, but keep the staircase clean and neat. And then when I put the battalion chief in, I said, you know, whoever it may be, Billy or, you know, Kenny, I go, listen, clean the stair. You know what a problem with the stair. And I, my job would be not to send too many people in to, clog the stair you know you know put two and two to work with keep the third engine available that type of stuff so again it's hard because when you work with a great group of guys and gals which i did they're all aggressive they all want to get in there and sometimes they're not again i use the words you're not going to get in the game at this particular moment just nice. wait yeah it's, it's it's fire ground management for lack of a better word no and i love it because i get to throw it right back and say it goes back to clark and that anticipation you're keeping those stairs yeah. clear for that anticipating that moment they you need them yes 
Dude, I love it. Okay. Uh, Ken Robertson said, clogging the stairs is a dangerous hazard. There's no doubt. I mean, it's dangerous when it's not on fire. <laughs> True. Brandon Duncan said, getting two lessons at one time, sitting in training, waiting for the next move, and listening to this. Nice job, Brandon. Way to make use of the time. <clears throat> All right, I'm pulling this up. Um, I want to get to a topic you are passionate about. You say it in your book that you're passionate about it. <clears throat> and I know from talking to you that you're passionate about it, but it's savable occupants. Yeah. Sort, sort of a hot button topic sometimes when it, gets, when it gets brought up on social media. Uh, oh, ahead. God. I'll it, let you go it, well, I mean, a hot button topic, my God, to say the least, or a heated topic or a very controversial topic, depending on who you talk to. Yeah. Um, you know, I always prided myself, and I know you and I talked about this, um, knowing the two plus two equals four equation. You know, I, I don't know, for lack of a better word, maybe the street smarts. And I've always, I don't say I always know, but let experience dictate a lot of what you say and or do. I know, in my opinion, in my backyard where I worked, that first line, more times than not, had to get into the front door, had to get the interior staircase. And we had to get, you know, control of the primary means of egress, which is that stair. I get water between the fire and people. Now, <clears throat> I followed a lot of, and I think it's great information. I think it's great intel on the NIST and UL studies from 2015 to till today. But the problem is, and I remember this way back in 2015, FDIC, they, they guys who presented, they did a great job. But I think they uh, missed the bigger picture here because they have to understand when you're talking in front of influence, people that are very influential, people who are, could be molded by your words, um, you got to remember, you got to bring the whole scenario in. You can't just talk about, you know, us, because this, this situation that we go to a building fire is not really about us it's about somebody else who's guarding the people in the building that's why we're here um, you know we are trained we're educated we have ppe we got breathing up press we got a hose line that can push 180 gallons a minute we are we know what we're doing for the most part but looking at the 2015 studies there was no conversation for a number of years about survivable spaces and people there was no conversation about smoke it was always about heat all right and fire, uh, which obviously does affect people in the building. But smoke, to me, is three times as more lethal, not my words, this research, as compared to heat. And the ability to get in and grab people, you know, knowing where they might be based on one experience or NFPA studies regarding the front door, staircases, the bedrooms, the hallways, you know, these the exit paths. I'm like, how in the name of God did this come up as part of that big conversation? You know, survival spaces and most of them will be smoke. Um, so I remember getting involved with this and saying, listen, everything you're talking about, putting water in a window has a place, but not always. My God, not always. And for you not to bring that up and kind of, you know, let the audience become part of more of the decision making. And more importantly to that, see, you got me going on this subject here. Absolutely. Um, uh, is not so much NIST and UL because they're a great, they're a great group. They, they really ch enhanced our learning or and our understanding of fire behavior between modern and legacy, outstanding information. I hope it continues. But I think the big problem was, if I could say this, and I will say this, is how some people interpreted that information and then packaged it and then presented it out as somebody who had influence. Now, when I say influence, a company officer at the kitchen table uh, who really didn't understand it well enough, or a fire instructor in the academy, or somebody who would write an article. I would say, listen, you have to look at the big picture here. It's not about us. It's about them. And we still have to, you know, get in there as aggressively as we can, get water where we need to get it regarding those survivable spaces and rest, search, rescue, and remove. No one talked about in 2015. Search, rescue, and remove. How in the name of God can't you bring that up as part of that conversation at an educational seminar? And someone said to me, well, that's what, not what it was about. Well, then I'll say to you a little bluntly, here's my jersey. It should have been. I mean, it should have been. Because people interpreted some of that information and kind of took it in the wrong direction. Uh, that we've, And I've heard this before at a seminar. I wasn't there, but I heard about it from a person. We've been doing it wrong. I'm like, really? We've been doing it wrong. I said, where the hell are you coming from? So... To bring that up, and I think what's happening now is, and you'll see this in social media, um, I think the website is firefighterrescuesurvey.com. Yes. They're actually, yeah, they're doing such great work in showing that 
how many people are actually saved from the hose line getting in the front door, the truck getting a little bit ahead of the water, the controlling of the vent with the water and getting to those survivable spaces, which we've known for decades exist. Yes. You know, the front door, the staircase, the bedrooms, the hallways. I mean, you didn't have to tell me that in a study. I knew that shit back in the seventies, but being able to bring that back out again and kind of not to, you know, tamper down, you know, the conversation regarding the science, because science is great, but science should not replace, it should enhance what we do. And I'll say that again, it should not replace, it should enhance. But at the same time, this firefighterrescuesurvey.com, I believe it is for your listeners, they're collecting data on this, how many people are actually rescued from the inside of the fire building from the firefighters. And it's, I don't want to say it's turning the conversation, but it's putting the conversation back into a little bit more reality. Yes on what we do know from decades of work does work. So again, I applaud NIST and you well. I hope they continue sharing the science, but science is not the end all or be all. It should enhance, it should not replace. And when you can, you gotta get the damn line in the front door, all right, when you can. 100%. So yeah, yeah, you can you can preach on that as long as you want to. Oh, God, oh, I, I can talk it. about love that it. all day. Yeah. Uh, believe me, I don't think anybody would uh, complain whatsoever. Uh, and Brian Brush and his study that he just he just finished doing, yes. I think it's 9.8 people per day being rescued by the actions of firefighters. And yeah. uh, and the firefighterrescuesurvey.com, go there, support it, uh, buy the, the – shirts the stickers uh, whatever they're selling to support and get that app out it's gonna i mean yes everything uh, everything she said i repeat it um yes i got even i even got like a mark for the the sound bite i'm gonna steal when you when you said it's not about us i love it man okay no it's not yeah it's not i want to go a little more philosophical as if that wasn't philosophical enough but i want to get a little philosophical here because 45 years chief that that's two decades on. I, I mean, I'm pushing my 25, and that's two decades on me. So I have some guests on here who are long in the tooth, but 45 years, man. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen throughout your career? And I'm just not talking tactics and equipment, although you can talk about technology and tactics. But, I mean, from the culture and everything, just, just whichever direction you want to go with it. Oh, the biggest changes, uh, we can go a couple different ways here. I mean, uh, you know, PPE, uh, you know, self-contained breathing apparatus. When I first came on, we didn't wear a mask. The first dimension, you know, they crawled down the hallway. Uh, that was the mindset back then. That was the culture. And the second dimension would mask up and take the line over from the first dimension and finish the hallway or finish off the room. Um, <laughs> that changed pretty – That's well, I'll tell you what, that changed pretty damn quick because – I remember, you know, having, I was with Engine 10. We were a pretty good company. And I remember Engine 20, you know, a few times, you know, because we just couldn't make it. You, you, how much shit can you suck in? Uh, you know, taking the line because they had the mask on. And I said to the guys I was working, I go, this shit ain't ever happening again. We're never giving up the line. So, <laughs> you know, it was kind of like before we had a mandatory mask rule. We had a, we created our own. Um, and then to go further here, you know, regarding SCBA and thermal imaging, uh, we could talk about that. That's great. But I think the, the, the more to your point, I think uh, probably a good answer is the ability today, and I know we talked about this a little bit before going on camera, um, of the firefighter and most notably the fire officer to be able to grab as much information out there that is humanly possible through the internet, through social media, through the internet. I mean, it's the information is limitless. All you got to do is pretty much get on your computer and Google it or follow you know, your programs or National Fire Radio or your Firehouse Magazine or Fire Engineering. There was so much information out there. So that's probably a great thing. The problem, I think, might be with that is you have to vet all that. Okay. You have to look through all of it. And in your own assessment, determine what is measurable and useful because I believe 99% of it is useful, but some of it may not be. Right. And I go, and I go back to when we talked about, you know, survival, survival spaces and, you know, flow path and transitional attack about how some people just misinterpret it and packaged it and presented it in, in my mind dangerously. So that's a good, but it's also a bad. Right. If that makes sense. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Cause uh, is it, it I, we reference it all the time, brass tacks and hard facts who say that, yeah. you know, drowning in information, starving for wisdom. And so it's, it's, it, you have to vet it. You has to be vetted. Uh, see what it is. Okay. I got lots of stuff coming at you here. Let me see. Um, is clogging the stairs freelancing or a failure of command to give assignments? 
I don't think it's freelancing. I, 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 when you think about it, as clogging the stairs to me uh, kind of points towards an aggressive group that want to go to work. Uh, so I don't want to say it's freelancing. But I think it's more of a command presence or a lack thereof. Uh, it's just that all I got to do is just turn and yell or nod or fingers, hands, whatever it may be. And they all know the value of keeping that stair open. And if they don't, then it's the responsibility of the officer or the chief after the incident, the after action, the kitchen table, the tailboard, whatever the hell you want to call it, to point out the value of keeping that stair clean. And it, it should resonate right away from your words and the understanding of the consequences. Right. So I think it's more of a command issue that needs to be addressed and it should be easily addressed pretty quick. Freelancing, no, I don't think at that particular point in that particular situation, I would say no. Uh, Dan Levesque, if I mispronounce it, I always say this guys, if I mispronounce your names, I'm sorry, I'm trying my best I can. He said, great point, if not for them, then why are you doing the study? You know, and he's going back to your point on the motivations behind the original studies. Uh, Richard Wiggins said, sporting that trainer die hat. Yes. Got it in today. So I had to wear it on the show. Trainer die. Love it. Um, uh, Marcio tech Sierra said, are the firefighters getting more theory instead of more practical? Oh, God. I hate to say this, but I would say in many instances, probably yes. Um, and for a number of different reasons. I mean, the workload from the 70s, 80s to you know, now 2021 has changed across the you know, across the specter. I mean, years ago, you used to get work every day, numerous times a day, and you learned you know, a lot that day. Um, so the answer is yes. And then it has to go back to, though, um, what is are we actually teaching the guys and gals in the academy? And how much time are we actually spending on? fire behavior. How much time are we actually spending in the burn building as compared to other subjects? Now, every subject is valuable, but when you're spending, uh, you know, and again, I don't want to upset our hazmat guys, when you're spending countless amounts of hours on hazmat, which is, again, a necessary understanding and a subject area that we have to be well in tune to, that cannot exceed, you know, what we do every day in fire behavior, or building a structural collapse and the actual stretching of the line, the timing of the glass, and there should be more time spent on that. Now, you might call it theory, but I think that hands-on with the theory and the more hours we allocate to that is going to make for a better firefighter in the street when they actually have to do that, which is where I think we make a difference. Not that hazmat's not important. I'll say that again. But, you know, a structure fire, people's lives in jeopardy, uh, that should be where we spend the lion's share of our academy training. And also, if I could take this and go one step further, it should be a significant part of the fire officers training, too, because they're the they're the decision makers. Uh, just because you got promoted and you raise your hand, that doesn't mean you automatically have it up here and you're done. You got to spend time with those guys and gals, too, in the academy, officer training and continue that, you know, training in the firehouse and in the academy throughout their careers because you never stop learning. You know, it's I, I mean, I'm you know, I'm retired now four years. I can't believe it's four years already, my God. But I I just took a class the other day uh, on RJ Research Rope. You know, it's um, you can't stop learning. And even though I'm not in front of a fire building anymore making decisions, which I believe me when I tell you, Corley, I miss that. I miss it greatly. I still have the opportunity to be asked to share a story or a subject matter. And I want to continue to wrap my arms around, you know, what I'm talking about and paying, paying attention to anything that's new. So point being, the training and education starts the day you get sworn in. It doesn't end until probably, in my opinion, the day you die. Awesome. Great quote. Uh, I may have to steal that and put it on a picture. Yeah. And put it it's all there. yours, brother. You can take it. Oh, go, I get, go. Write it down 3847. <laughs> I got to write down the timestamps quote. Sorry, I got to take my notes. Jacob Johnson, thank you for sharing the link to firefighterrescuesurvey.com. Everybody should go there and check it out. David Pruitt said, if the NIST and UL should sit down with your generation and round out their message before they put it out to the masses. Well, I mean, I don't want to say, uh, I, I think they are doing that. I mean, I know uh, there are some great people on the panel, young and old, uh, that are involved with the, you know, the sharing of the intel and how to put it together and package it and get it out there. I think that's uh, happening. It's been happening for quite a few years. I don't know if it happened right away in the beginning, uh, just based on my assessment. But again, listing you well, Thank God you're, you're there and you're doing things and they are bringing a lot of great people on board. I know some of them personally and they're bringing the conversation to to the street. 
You know, it's not this E equals MC squared stuff. They're bringing it down to two plus two equals four is where we do all of our work. Nice. Nice. Uh, Devin Craig said, love it. Spend more time on the basics. Solid. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Why? I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to phrase this question to you, chief, but why is it that the other disciplines have seemed to creep in and they have, they have mandatory requirements on hours spent, but yet the basics have, have, are the ones that seem to suffer. Well, they, they creep in because people let them creep in. I mean, uh, again, uh, not taking any value away from those areas, but they should not exceed, in my opinion, you know, structural firefighting. That, that should be on the top. That has, should have the most hours allocated to it on every discipline from engine, truck, chief. I mean, you should have a significant amount of time in theory and practical on learning the, the trade. Because this is where, you know, we're making our biggest impact. And the Firefighter Rescue Survey dot com, I think, proves that. Um, again, I don't take anything away from any of these other disciplines. But, you know, if you have the opportunity to change the training curriculum and, and, and kind of fix those hours and those subject areas as it relates to what I think is the stuff that we make the biggest impact on, I'll say this to you bluntly, do it. What the hell? Do you, you don't need an act of Congress to do this, I don't think. I mean, God forbid if we had to wait for that. Um, just get get shit done. I mean, if you are the training division boss or you have the opportunity to steer your academy or the state, local level, whatever it may be, listen, figure the shit out and get it done. I mean, nice. it, 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 this is not stuff that you need to be told to do. We've been doing this a long time, and we know where we, we can make the greatest impact regarding people, and that's what we're here for, you know, the, the man, the woman, and the child. And if we forget that, and I know we don't forget that, but if we lose sight of that and we kind of water that down, I think that's a tragedy. And that has, that has to change. And it should change. And I believe in a lot of areas across, and your listeners will probably back me up, it is changing. But maybe not for everybody. Sorry, I had to timestamp another quote. You're firing them off at a rapid pace, Chief. Uh, <laughs> uh, Devin Craig said, the other areas are flashy. And he said that with a, with a laugh. Um, all right. I want to ask you this question because I really want to hear the answer to it. But uh, if you could go back in time with all of your knowledge and all of your experience that you now have under your belt and you could talk to 18-year-old Mike Turpak, what would you tell him? Oh, God. I, I, I would probably tell him three things. Okay. Sit down, shut up, and listen, if I could say that. Um, you know, when I was a young fireman, you know, I had the opportunity again to work at a couple of uh, busy houses and a couple of busy battalions. And, you know, after a couple of months, a year, you think, you know, you come out, you, you know, you're a little salty. You think you know what you're doing and uh, you don't, you really don't, you know? So uh, again, as a young firefighter, 18 years old, sit down and shut up and listen and continue to listen. And, you know, when you have that, and I watch my finger again, Corley, when you get ranked, then maybe you can start to open up your mouth a little bit. You know, not that a senior firefighter has no value. My God, I, I seen the, the senior guys I work with, I would listen to them many times. But for the for your question specifically, 18 years old, uh, sit down, shut up and listen. Yeah. I like it. Now, my question, the follow up that I like to ask is Would 18 year old Mike listen to you? Oh, God. Probably not. He probably would need an ass kicking, I think, a little bit. Right. Um, I, I, and I say that tongue in cheek, uh, not all the time. I mean, there, there was, I was humbled countless times throughout my career, even as a fire officer, as a boss. I, mean, I could tell you millions, millions of stories, but I think as a young firefighter, you got to really just listen and, you know, wrap your arms around your senior people. Of course, they've sit, been there and done that and seen it. Of course, your officers, obviously the seasoned officers, the, the officers who really influence, uh, you know, obviously the decisions. Um, so, uh, yes or no. An ass kicking, but at the same time, not every day. Nice. Nice. I like it. All right. Uh, I want to read this. Uh, Scott Sanders said, mastering the basic skills can lead to a default aggressive mindset. Be able to do everything with your gloves on. Be a blue-collar fireman that treats every fire like it is his home on fire with his family trap. Be that guy slash gal. Yeah, very well said. Very I mean, well said. You can't say it better than that. Great quote. I wanted to ask you about, before I get into, I'm going to ask you about promotional assessment centers, but I'm going to, I want to ask you about this 3 a.m. innovations thing and the um, digital age. So, Yeah, oh, great, great question. Um, I'm actually uh, heading up to Boston um, 
I got this is a real busy week for me. I got uh, classes tomorrow and Wednesday, promotional assessment classes. And at 3 a.m., let me talk to you briefly about the 3 a.m. guys. 3 a.m. Innovations, uh, 3 a.m. Innovations.com is a company that's out of uh, Buffalo, New York, and they have an adaptive tactical software uh, that is, in my opinion, changing the way the fire surface is going to be moving forward. And the funny part about it is I, we talked a moment ago. I'm, I always prided myself on being a two plus two equals four guy. You know, you know, the line goes here, you take the glass here, the fire goes out, we go home. And when I became a boss, I was able to run incidents with my aide on a whiteboard or maybe a little clipboard. And things worked pretty well. But when I saw what these guys were doing regarding this adaptive command tactical software, and they brought in to me, they brought in the digital era. era. And um, I had to go to a little bit from 2 plus 2 equals 4 to E equals MC squared a little bit. Nice. And I think if you don't look at things like these guys, what they're doing, I think you're going to miss out here because they have brought the measurable side on the digital era age uh, to the fire ground. And I've been working with them as a consultant, I guess, for about a year and a half now. And they brought myself in, uh, another buddy of mine from Newark, uh, Johnny Riker, great guy. Another buddy of mine from the Bronx, Danny Sheridan, Ron Cabrero from out in L.A. County, Steve Hintz from uh, New York City as well. And we're all a little bit uh, long in the tooth. I'll use your quote. You know, we were, and they all knew that, the 3 a.m. guys, that we were, um, you know, old school, you know, two plus two equals four. And I think the mindset by bringing us in as consultants, our customer service reps for them is to, if we can convince these guys, meaning guys, a guy like me, that this stuff has a place and is measurable, we know it's gonna be able to get out there and be used by people regarding age, regarding you know how many years they have. Right. And I'll tell you, um, I'm heading up, they're actually the guys right now, they're in Boston. Uh, it's working with Boston Fire because Boston Fire is wrapping their arms around this. And I'm going to be heading up there Wednesday and Thursday to do some training with those guys at Boston Fire. It's it, To me, it's mind-blowing, and it has a place on the fire ground. When I first looked at it, I'll tell you quickly, when I first looked at it, I was like, listen, stop. I got enough shit to do. I can't be glancing at a tablet or a computer screen. But they have brought it to the fire ground in such a way that you want to take a look at things regarding company location, building intelligence, you know, maps, street view, um, that you don't have to be saddled with this, but you can glance at it or have your aide who's running the incident, your command tech, be looking at it. And, you know, you're looking over his shoulder just to get an idea where 15 engine is a ladder nine or taking, taking another look at the roof and the, you know, the dead loads on the roof. So long story short. 3 a.m. innovations. Uh, your listeners got to check them out. My God, they're, it's mind blowing what they're doing. I'm glad to be part of the team. I really am. Wow, that is, that is a strong endorsement. So I'm glad I asked you about it. Yeah. Uh, promotional assessment centers. You have literally written a book on it. So I can <laughs> say you are an expert. Is this from a personal experience from sitting on so many promotional boards? Is it a passion, a gift, or and, and I, you go around and teach classes on it? So. Well, it was based on a necessity. Um, you know, a hundred years ago, the only way to pretty much to become to be assessed to become a fire officer, at least in Jersey, was you took a hundred question multiple choice exam on you know twenty five ISTA books, and uh, you know, that was the only game in town. And the multiple choice exam, just based on that type of assessment, was kind of like you know, it, well, we all found that in the, the hard way. It was kind of a, a poor way to assess the knowledge, skills, and ability of a boss because you were just being able to assess the individual on their ability to retain the information from the book. Right. Yeah. So Jersey kind of, you know, through a lot of different challenges in litigation, went from multiple choice exams to scenario based multiple choice, which put a little bit more measurability into that. But then they went into, and this is probably, I bet you it's about 30 some odd years ago. They went into oral assessments, which was a whole game changer. Uh, and you had to, uh, to verbalize things. You had to pretty much, explain what you were doing, give the clarifying statement, the objective of why the line was being stretched and how the truck was going to vent, how that was going to be timed, and how you were going to manage. And when that came into into the promotional field in Jersey, I said, I got to learn this stuff because obviously I want to be a boss. I got to learn how to play this part of the, for lack of a better word, a game. Sure. So it goes back to researching it and looking at things. You know, California, the West Coast was, was using it longer before we did. And uh, when it came to Jersey, and I don't think anybody on the East Coast is really using it that much back then. I'm going back into the 80s now. Um, 
I learned it and I studied it and I practiced it. And, you know, I had some bumps. I figured out how to get through things and how to verbalize and use eye contact and body language to show the confidence and clarity and conviction of what I was saying to the assessor. And it just worked its way into now me tutoring people on it, you know, based on things that went well for me, things that didn't go well for me. And I, we do it now through a company called Promotional Prep. Uh, you know, another plug here, promotionalprep.com, if I can plug it. Um, I work with another, a couple of great guys here in Jersey. Uh, you know, Frankie Montaigne out of North Hudson and Al Pratt's out of North Hudson. Uh, we have a whole team of people that help people get ready for the oral assessment and the written assessment from Jersey. And believe it, we have a client base that goes all the way out to Hawaii. Uh, so it's, it's fun. It's passionate uh, because you can bring the experience in but at the same time you have to be able to understand you got to verbalize it. it's got to come from here and how to do that is probably the biggest challenge nice nice how do you stay plugged in because you've done this a while what's your advice for others who want to stay in it and fired up for the long game oh stay in the game i mean stay in the game as long as you can uh if you're active obviously that's easy to do at the kitchen table to me was invaluable i always said that you know the kitchen tables in many instances where you learn the most information and I, every time we would come back from an incident whether i was a company officer or as a chief officer i would say and i know i just said this to a good friend of mine uh i don't know if you, frankie viscuso uh, was a great guy from jersey oh yeah great oh outstanding on what his leadership frankie i was just doing a conversation with him and i said you know personally speaking i would make the kitchen table rankless I would go, listen, I don't care your your rank is, how many years you're going to, tell me what you saw, what you did. Tell me what you think went well. Tell me what you think didn't go well. And let's learn from not only the senior guy and the guy who's got something on his collar, let's learn from the, the two-year kid. And maybe he could bring something to the table that we can all share or learn from. So getting staying in the game and allowing people to participate in the game, uh, I think is probably one of your best assets today. Wow, no, that's great, man. Because even even if the two year guy doesn't bring knowledge that that or, or understanding, which I'm not saying they can't, they can absolutely. But even if he just bring, if he's able to bring up something he didn't understand why something went down, you're like something you take for granted, and all of a sudden you can explain it. Absolutely, uh, you, you can't shudder anybody. Uh, right. Again, I would say that, that everything here is rankless, uh, to, and we we'll go around the table. Because I said in 15 minutes we could be going back out the door again. Let's learn something real quick here. And then we'll do the formal stuff if we need to, you know, next tour or nice. a little bit later in the day. Yeah. Love it. All right. I always like to ask my guests if they have book or books that they think firefighters should be reading. So. <laughs> well, what I was a great lead in, of course, the fire ground size of book, the second edition is probably the best book ever written. Oh, that it, was a great. <laughs> I might have it close. There you go. It's a plug. <laughs> Um, uh, but, but be quite honest, I'm a big fan of uh, Vincent Dunn's books, uh, a good friend and a mentor. I actually, in my office here, I'm looking right up at his books, uh, The Collapse of Burning Buildings, uh, Safety and Survival on the Fire Ground. I love anything that Vincent Dunn does. I'm a big fan of John Norman's stuff, uh, his fifth edition, you know, Fire Officer. Uh, Glenn Corbett and Frank Brannigan's Building Construction for the Fire Service. Um, Frank Vesciusco's uh, Frankie Vescuso, uh, his leadership books. Um, there's so many, there are so many, but absolutely. they're, they're, these, they're the top three or four right away. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Okay. It's going to take me a while to put all those in the list, but I'll get them in there eventually. If I ever get caught up, cause I'm, I'm in like the 50 or the forties right now of catching up on the suggested reading list. So eventually I'll get to number 87 here. Uh, there you go. awesome. Okay. Chief, uh, let me see if I got anything else to read at you before I get you to the five questions. Every fireman can teach you something. That's from Devin Craig, and I agree with you 100%. Chris Daliani said, Chief, how are you? As a young company officer, I've noticed in a short amount of time that the newer generation seem to lack motivation and initiative to want to learn. To the extent, this is a long one, sorry. To the extent new firefighters rarely ask questions and fail to seem to be into the job. Do you feel this is a result of the newer mindset of this generation coming up or a result of officers failing to take the initiative to change that mindset? What do you suggest oh. officers do to motivate and teach both new and senior members? Long question. Yeah. Sorry. Threw it at you. Yeah. <laughs> no, great, great question. I was actually, uh, hello to Chris. I was just with Chris the other day. We're okay. sitting next to each, each, each other in class. Um, don't blame the generation. I mean, yeah, listen, I understand. They're from a different era. I got that. Maybe they're, they, they don't have the trades. They're not the plumbers, the carpenters, electricians. Maybe you know, they're on their phones or on a computer. Or they go to the game room. 
whatever the hell that means. I mean, I know what it means, but you know, I, I'm going to go after the company officer. I'll be quite honest with you. You find a way. You stop. You dig in. You're the boss. You got shit on your collar that says you're a boss. Get them involved. All right. F find a way to get them motivated, involved. And I always say this, especially some of the newer officers. When I said do the fire officer academy in Jersey, so they go listen. If they are even giving you the slightest pushback, you know, bring family into the equation. Talk to them about, you know, the, their family. Talk about the family in the firehouse, and talk about the family who dialed nine one one. I go, listen, if that doesn't motivate them, all right, then we'll find something else for them to do. You know, I'll get them on a street corner directing traffic or some shit like that. But I would say the company officer. I don't want to say he's to blame here, but look at yourself and find a number of ways to get these people into the conversation and don't ever let go of them because these are the future bosses. And if you don't mold them and move them in a great direction, uh, think about when you leave what you left the job with. Right on. So I'm going to say company officers, uh, find a find a way. All right? And family resonates with everybody, uh, family. And even if it's a guy who doesn't have a family, it's a single guy. If he's got a – I mean, I have a little – we talked about our pets before. He's got on the air. I mean, uh, even if he, got a, he has a pet in mean, the – yeah, you know the value of getting in there and getting a little puppy out, right. shit like that. Right you know, figure it the hell out. All right, and here's the point. All right? Don't look for excuses here and keep blaming another generation. Yeah, there's challenges, but you find a freaking way. All right, and find it quick. Love it. And, and there's too many quotes already from this scrap. Uh, totally agree, Chief. Yes, everybody said. Devin Craig said, "In the large amount of time I've dealt with the new generation." At the fire academy, the issue is they learn different. They can ask questions to their phone and get answers immediately without being ostracized. Yeah. It's a lot yeah, of truth there. Yeah, don't dismiss them. Uh, bring them in. Find a way. And if you got to navigate through the electronics to get them in, all right, learn how to use your smartphone. If that's the challenge, figure it out. Absolutely. Love it. Okay. So on the scrap, we have a thing we do every week. It's called the five questions for firefighters. There is no right or wrong answers generally speaking. Um, but the answers are completely your opinion and the points are passed out by me and they're completely arbitrary. So chief Mike Turpak, are you ready for the five questions for firefighters? Oh yeah, I'm ready. Right. Fire away. Here we go. Number one, what is the number one issue facing the modern fire service? Oh God. I think we kind of brought that in maybe a half hour ago. I think it's the, the ability to vet all the information that's out there go through it and pick out what's measurable and understand, pick out not only what's measurable, but stuff that is measurable specifically to your own backyard. Uh, you know, whatever your challenges are, if you have a tremendous amount of lightweight construction, garden apartments, townhouses, trust supported floors, uh, trust, you know, TJIs, that type of thing, you should become the expert in that. And there's so much information out there. So that's a challenge, but again, vet it, go through it, take the time and pick out what's going to be measurable to you. Uh, and which makes sense, I think is probably the answer to that question. I think I love it. I love it. Cause there is man, there is no excuse. You can't be an expert of no. your backyard. There is none. Uh, I would like to hear, man, maybe I'll do that. What's your best excuse for not being an expert in your district? Um, yeah. but no, that's not a question. So number two, what is the thing you are most excited about for the future of firefighting? <clears throat> oh, this is going to sound a little weird, but I think it's almost the, the answer, same answer to the first question is the ability to have this information available to you uh, and learning from others, whether it's the firefighter rescue survey dot com or picking up, you know, Frank Brannigan or Glenn Corbett's book. I mean, there is I mean, when I started, we didn't have a lot of uh, text material. First of all, there was no Internet when I started back in 76. Uh, we had some, you know, ifs the books, you know, some good reads, of course, a couple hardcovers. But now, my God, the amount of books that are out there in paper form, or electronic form, we mentioned ago, social media, the Internet. I'm really excited about that. It's there's a ton of stuff out there to answer back to your first question. The challenge is vetting it. But again, don't let that discourage it. Just spend the time, pick the subject that is most critical to you and start to get into it. And you'll find a lot of good and useful information from people who have done it before. Nice. People who, who, you know, had some good experiences, some bad experiences. I mean, God, that's – I wish I had that back in the 70s and 80s, even a little bit into the 90s, because I think I would have been a little bit more well-versed. I would have been – how about this one? I would have been maybe a better anticipator. Nice. You know, yeah. 
taking it full circle back to the first yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, number three. What is the best? And this is a great one to ask you because you've pretty much done it all. What is the best rank or position to be in in the fire service? Oh God, I think they were all great. I really do. I love being a fireman. I guess I had the opportunity to work the engine, the truck, and the rescue. I love being a company officer because I had the ability to make decisions in the hallways. You know, still getting in there and getting a little dirty, if I could say that. I love the battalion and deputy chief positions. But if I had to pick one. I think the company officer was probably the, the, one of the greatest and most influencing because you influence so much, on not only on the inside of the building and the hallway and the staircase and how you're directing the companies, the hose line, you know, cleaning up the stairs, you know, pulling the ceilings. Right. But at the same time, how the company officer can influence with his words, what he was seeing and, and feeling and doing to the chief officer. Mm. And I remember the story we talked about before. I think we got it. And the chief says, no, I don't think you do. You know, that type of thing. So I think the company officer is an extremely valuable position. And I probably had probably the most fun during that time frame. And I realized the value of being on the inside and doing things and sharing the information on the outside with the boss with the white shirt. Excellent answer, man. Always max points for company officer. That is a, a great. And, and it's not just that. The way you explained it out is, is excellent answer. Number four is the best advice you ever received. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I mentioned this before, your backyard. I mean, um, stay true and relevant and measurable in what you're experiencing. Now, if you don't have a vacant building issue, um, I don't want to say you don't want to look at vacant buildings or study them, but if your backyard is full of lightweight construction, you should be well-versed in lightweight construction. Um, if you've got high rise issues, be well versed in high rise. Um, what your backyard is, and then if I can add to that, dovetail off that, is the best advice is is keep your senior people close, even if they're retired, even if they're retired. Nice. Bring them in, bring them in. I said this not too long ago to another group of people. Invite them in for lunch, you know, invite them for dinner, and when they start to talk about the fire in 1985 that they went to, shut the TV off. You know, put your phone down and listen to their experience. Uh, they have seen things that maybe you'll never see or maybe you will see. And you can learn from that conversation, those experiences. So uh, keep the senior people close because uh, they're worth their weight in gold, in my opinion. It's strong, man. Mm. I love that. Uh, I want to I, I honestly want to reach out and ask people who does if anybody has a formal like like part of their organization uh, where they actually reach out to their retirees and bring them in, you know what I'm saying? Or who even has informal ones. I would love to know that. So yeah. that's great, man. Uh, keep your senior people close. Uh, final question. Question number five, <clears throat> you have heavy fire and searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? Man, you got a lot of great questions tonight. Excellent. Um, uh, I, I started on an engine, and you know we always used to fight. It's a short story. We used to fight for the we used to fight for the nozzle. Right on. To the point where the lieutenant at the time we had a nozzle list. If you can imagine that, I, I, I believe this, it. Yeah, like this tour, Mike, you got it. Next tour, Mark, you got it. Next tour, Jimmy, you have it. Because we would actually, and it was a short story. A good friend of mine who died, got you know, guy rest his soul. Um, you know, Jersey City guy, Captain Marky e. Lee, on nine eleven. You know. He got pretty sick. But I remember one time we had this short story, but it makes me laugh every time I think about it. There's no time limit. Uh, You tell as many stories as you want. I promise you. Before we had this nozzle list, (coughs) I'm not, you know, I muscled my ass to the back step and we're first through on a fire someplace. And I'm pulling the line. As I'm starting to pull the line and nozzle to lead length, he knocks my helmet off purposely. <laughs> like this. And as I turn to go get my helmet, he pushes me and he takes the line and the nozzle. And he's, he was like, Mark was a little guy. He's in the front door. I'm like, you son of a, you know. Yeah. And the lieutenant saw that and he laughed. But I'm, and, and Mark was a great fan and I miss him dearly. But I go, you know, that influenced me. So um, to answer your question, I love the VES. I love, you know, being on the roof. I love, you know, the search ahead of the line. But I got to say, if I had to pick one, uh, I like being on a nozzle. 100%. I really did. Yeah. I can't argue, yeah. man. That's a great answer. Yeah. I love the story yeah. too, man. Yeah, it was a great story, right? <laughs> true, bro. Every word of it's true too, that little son of a bitch. But yeah, I miss him. But 
Great guy. Fair enough. There it is. The five questions for firefighters, according to Chief Mike Turpak. Brother, I've had a blast, man. Oh, this is fun. Thank you so much for the invite, man. This is great. Uh, I, I love talking and sharing stories. I love when we were together in Texas. Uh, I hope it continues. And uh, again, I really enjoyed tonight. I really did. No, it's been a blast. Uh, best place to contact you. Uh, book a class, buy a book, reach out, get information. You know, what have you got coming up? Go. This is where you can plug anything you want. <clears throat> oh, we got a bunch of things coming up. Well, now that COVID is, thank God, yes. starting to calm down a little bit. Um, uh, we were very busy prior to COVID, but things are starting to open up again. A lot of promotional stuff coming up. Uh, a lot of educational stuff is starting to come in. People are calling me to come out and share a story or two. So you can get me on Facebook, get me on Instagram. You can, you know, Mike Turpeck, Fire Service Training and Consulting. You know, I had to put a title in it. Or Fireground Size Up MT, my initials at gmail.com. You can always reach out and share with a comment or a story. If I could help you with a seminar, I'd be more than happy to come out and visit you. Awesome. Uh, all right, there we go. I want to talk about my conference that I have coming up on June 25, 26, and 27. Um, it is 100%. Uh, everything that's made off the conference is going to the families of fallen firefighters. It was inspired by the two that died in Wayne, Oak, Oklahoma in January of this year doing that search, uh, the tragedy that happened there. A um, lot of stuff going on, but I want to hype it while I have everybody here, which is go to firehousevigilance.com slash conference. Tell your friends if they're in the area, if they want to come, they buy tickets and come. It's got an amazing lineup of speakers, an amazing uh, hot track with search, fire attack, and the can, tick, and irons, all under live fire conditions. It's going to be an amazing conference. We're going to have socials every night, a gigantic raffle with so much to give away. I would come just to be in on the raffle. Uh, so anyway, that's everything I want to say about that. Um, I like to talk about a challenge coin each and every week if I have one to talk about. So this one came from my friend Jake Barnes, Three Point Firefighter Podcast. It's the uh, International Society of Fire Service Instructors, ISFSAI, and that is his coin. It's going into my collection back there. If you have a coin to add to the collection, send it in. Guys, I love collecting these these letters from you guys when you tell me about what the coin means and the history of the coin and, and why you made it the way you made it, and I love sharing it on here and showing people if it'll, if it'll focus. I love it, man. So, anyway... Thank you so much to my friend Jake Barnes. Um, Chief, that was an amazing scrap. I had a blast. Oh, it was a blast. I thank you again for the invite. I thank your listeners for spending some time with us tonight. Uh, I could do this every night. So give me a call tomorrow, same time. I'll make time. I, 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 I tell you this, man. We need to get it to where I just had you come on and you tell stories. I mean, seriously, and just and scrap the scrap the questions. I just want to hear the stories. No, it was great. Thank you again so much. I'm honored to be on the program. Thank you. Everyone that watched, thank you for the questions, the comments. Uh, you guys make the scrap truly great and memorable and throw the curveballs at us that the Chief had to field. And truthfully, field them like a pro. You guys didn't even, you didn't even trip him up. We'll have to try better <laughs> next time. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, audience. To everyone listening, I hope this don't, the tone stays silent unless it's burning. Stay safe out there. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>